Oaks is the way it is because of E.K. Warren, who turned a tiny rustic settlement into a bustling village with jobs, electricity, running water, roads and sidewalks, and civic pride. He really created the town of Three Oaks in a way. The benefits of E.K. Warren's remarkable success story are with us to this day, but let's back up. To 1858, when 10-year-old Edward Kirk Warren moved with his family from Vermont to Three Oaks, then a farming and timber town of fewer than 500 people. The Warrens lived in a log cabin just south of town. Edward's father, Waters Warren, was a preacher. As a teen, Warren worked in the dry goods store owned by Henry Chamberlain, Three Oaks' most distinguished citizen. In just a few years, E.K. Warren had also become a very successful merchant. But in 1882, he had an idea that changed his life and life in the region of Three Oaks. The foundation of a Victorian lady's wardrobe was her corset. It provided postural support for the wearer and structural support for the outer garments. By narrowing the waist, it created a broad platform for skirts to rest upon. As a merchant, Warren had heard lots of complaints about corsets, particularly the whalebone used to stiffen them. It dried out and became brittle over time, and whalebone had gotten expensive. On a trip to a Chicago feather duster factory, Warren came across turkey feathers being discarded. Point feathers not fluffy enough for dusters, and he came up with the idea of recycling feather spines into material that could replace whalebone in stiffening corsets. Warren patented the idea in 1883 and began producing what he called feather bone within months. Writing to Scientific American magazine, he called Featherbone a better and more enduring substance than whalebone, for it will not break or warp and cannot be injured by perspiration or boiling water. Warren had just nine employees, many of them children at the start. They stripped plumage from the feathers, then split the spine open, removing the stuff inside the spine, the pith, to be sold as fertilizer, while cutting the spine itself into long strands. Strands bound together with thread, the eventual result being a flat strip of feather bone, flexible but stiff enough to mold a woman's shape when sewn into foundation garments. Warren began making feather bone whips as well. It was not easy. A former business partner would write, Many times the future looked black and discouraging, but B.K. Warren was always cheerful and optimistic and sure success would come. He advertised heavily to convince dressmakers to give his new product a try. Eventually, success came. Warren told his housekeeper he made 50 cents every time the clock ticked. Three Oaks experienced a featherbone boom. Featherbone buildings sprang up year after year, and Warren factory jobs brought people. Actually, the working conditions at Warren Featherbone were quite good, and the pay was, for that time, was really uh, fairly generous. Three Oaks population nearly doubled between 1880 and 1890. Housing grew scarce. According to an 1893 account, The rapid development of the industry cannot keep pace with the steadily increasing demand for Featherbone for use in dress stays and corsets, and there is no doubt that it will eventually be employed in scores of widely diverse articles requiring a reliable, elastic material. Warren came up with ways dressmakers could use his product from head to toe. Featherbone became a fashion watchword advertised in national women's magazines. Featherbone salons sprang up in major cities in the U.S. and across the globe, where fashion-conscious women and dressmakers could learn about Featherbone's benefits. This one on Broadway in New York. The building is still there today. While guiding his business from idea to worldwide enterprise, E.K. Warren was also bringing Three Oaks, now a company town, his company town, into the new century. There was a big broad streak of paternalism in E.K. Warren, so he did try to control, in a benevolent way, I think, a lot of Three Oaks. He owned the bank. He bought the newspaper. And he operated farms and stores. You know, he was our great big father in the community, wrote one resident. He loved Three Oaks as a child and nursed and championed everything she undertook. 
In 1896, when Warren was village president, he put electric lights on his factory and offices, trying to persuade voters to approve money for a municipal power plant. The Featherbone Company owned Three Oaks Press wrote, It is a sample of what the whole town can have if the voters of the place so choose. The voters so chose, the power lines went up. Warren, owner of one of the area's first cars, led successful efforts to build better roads and sidewalks and to build a water system for the village. Though even as he urged running water, he advocated making Three Oaks dry. The town had but one saloon, but E.K. Warren, guided by his religion and conviction that his workers would be better off without access to alcohol, led a campaign to ban liquor sales in town. In the end, his money carried the day. Three Oaks shuttered its only saloon in 1896 after Warren agreed to pay $250 to the village treasury to make up for lost saloon license revenue. Not everyone in town was happy about it. The Three Oaks Acorn newspaper would write, His stand on the liquor question brought him many personal enemies, as well as much abuse and humiliation. The paper even saying the bitter campaign had prompted an attempt on Warren's life, though it gave no details. Still, just two years later, E.K. Warren would unite Three Oaks and thrust the village again into national prominence. The U.S. was fighting the Spanish-American War, and the National Monument Committee was raising money to build a memorial to the fallen. As an incentive, they offered a cannon captured by Admiral George Dewey in the Battle of Manila as a prize for the city or town that raised the most money per capita. Three Oaks Against the World was what E.K. Warren dubbed the wildly successful fundraising campaign he led. It raised more than $1,100, or $1.41 for every man, woman, and child in town. Three Oaks' generosity made headlines across the country. The Detroit Free Press applauded what it called the plucky little city that had sprung into worldwide fame with its fundraising victory. And the Chicago Tribune paid tribute with a cartoon. Three Oaks may be little, but oh my. The town celebrated its fundraising triumph with a parade and fireworks. Enthusiasm was at a boiling point in every man, woman, and child, reported the Three Oaks Press. It was the 4th of July, Memorial Day, and Circus Day all rolled into one. Months later, when Warren learned that President William McKinley would soon pass through town by train, he invited the president to stop and speak. McKinley agreed, and in October 1899, 3,000 people from across the region flooded Three Oaks to hear the president. I am glad to observe the patriotic disposition of this people to preserve as a lesson for all who may come after the great achievements of the American Navy. When the cannon was formally dedicated the next year, Warren took pains to ensure Three Oaks would be a gracious host, distributing flyers around town urging citizens to take the day off and prepare food and drink for visitors. Under no circumstances must exorbitant charges be made for food sold or service rendered. Our guests must be treated with the utmost courtesy, extended with pleasure and cordiality. All must unite in this, or our guests would have reason to form an unfavorable opinion of us. 10,000 people converged on Three Oaks to witness the unveiling in June 1900, a star-shaped tent falling away to reveal the Dewey Cannon which, of course, stands in Three Oaks to this day. E.K. Warren's next big project would involve worship on a worldwide scale. A faithful member of Three Oaks Congregational Church, where his father had been pastor, Warren had become a leader in the National Sunday School movement and was a driving force behind the decision to hold the 1904 World Sunday School Convention in Jerusalem. Warren chartered the German ocean liner Grosser Kurfürst so that seven to 800 U.S. delegates could attend the convention. They embarked on a 10-week-long cruise through the Mideast and Europe, touring the sites of the ancient world, both before and after the World Convention, which Warren presided over. In 1914, at age 66, E.K. Warren retired from running the Featherbone Company. He split his time between a mansion on the lakefront in Evanston, Illinois, and a summer home called Vine Cottage in Lakeside. By then, he also owned nearly a million acres of ranch land in the American Southwest and Mexico. Family albums show Warren as benevolent grandfather, enjoying children and grandchildren with wife Mary, the daughter of his old mentor, Henry Chamberlain. 
After a brief bout with pneumonia, E.K. Warren died in January of 1919 and was buried in his family's plot in Forest Lawn Cemetery south of Three Oaks. His family received condolences from around the world. He stood for honesty of purpose, industry, and an unimpeachable manhood. Achievement without honor was nothing to him. Three Oaks would never have been anything if your father had not built it up, and it is a monument to his name. He touched the world at many angles and influenced the lives of many thousands for great and lasting good. Warren left an estate of seven million dollars. That's well over a hundred million in today's dollars. In his will, he said he wanted the company that bore his name to remain in Three Oaks. But that company, built on sales of buggy whips and corsets, would have to adapt to survive. E.K. Warren's great-grandson, Gus Whalen, joked his family's company followed Native American wisdom. The Dakota Indians have a saying. If the horse is dead, dismount. The Featherbone Company dismounted nimbly when whips and corsets went out of style. Warren production lines switched to making sewing notions, and then plastic baby pants and shower caps and children's clothing. Featherbone Company factories employed people in Three Oaks for decades after E.K. Warren's death. The company finally packed up and left Three Oaks for Georgia in 1956. But much of the old Featherbone complex survived, having been put to other uses a century after E.K. Warren put it in place. Warren left significant natural legacies in this area, too. Warren Woods, 311 acres of virgin forest just north of Three Oaks, is now a state park, as is Warren Dunes, nearly 2,000 acres of extraordinary lakeshore dune lands near Bridgman. It draws nearly a million visitors a year. So E.K. Warren, the man who once brought modern times to Frontier Three Oaks, also has ensured that a bit of what used to be is still there for us. <laughs>